anyone in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Beloved, take a step back and think about how dramatic that statement is. This is not a wishful statement, this is a fact. Anyone, no matter how broken you are in sin, no matter how entrenched you are or addicted to various things in darkness, if we come to Jesus and are born again, a radical, dramatic miracle happens in our spirit. He says that we are a new creation. Now what he's talking about here is that the he who is a new creation is talking about our spirit man. As you know that we are spirit, soul, and body. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Your spirit is entirely, instantly, and fully made new in one moment the day that you're born again. Old things, that is, that are related to your spirit. Now I'll break that down in a minute. They are gone forever, not should be gone. Not we hope they are gone. In God's sight, it is a fact of our legal position, the way that he sees us in his, in his presence, the old things are gone instantly, the things related to our spirit. Again, I'll break that down in a minute. All things have become new. Now again, in this age, all things related to our spirit and our mind, emotion, and will, the goal is to walk in that progressively <clears throat> through our life in this age. Then he says it very dramatically. I cannot imagine exaggerating. The, you cannot exaggerate the glory of verse 21. Look at this. We have become the righteousness of God. Now just stop. What on earth does that mean? I mean, that can't possibly mean what it says it means, but it does. Your spirit, or your born-again spirit, or your spirit man, say it the way you want to, received the righteousness of God. I'm talking about a righteousness that will never, ever improve even a billion years from now. God gave you a righteousness through Jesus that even God cannot improve on because it's God's own righteousness. I mean, even He can't improve it because it's the fullness of His righteousness. That righteousness is in your spirit the day you're born again. Now, the big problem, many believers are not aware of this at all. So they live in their soul, their mind, emotion, and will, as though the miracle that happened in their spirit did not really happen. They know they're forgiven, so they kind of grit their teeth and hang on until eternity. But beloved, it's more than forgiveness. A miracle happened in your spirit. It's not figurative. It's not symbolic. The righteousness of God literally dwells in your spirit, for you have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Instantly, fully, freely, you receive the gift. That is the power of what Jesus did on the cross in the grace of God. <clears throat> now again, the all things that are made new are all things related to our spirit. Let's break this down the next few moments. You get your mind around it, and it might take you more than just hearing this for a few minutes, but go home, get with some friends, look this up. If you can't find this in the Bible, throw it away. Challenge everything you hear from anybody. Do it with a humble spirit. But you are responsible, I tell our students this all the time, the IHOP you students, challenge everything you hear me and Alan Hood say or any other teacher in this Bible school. Make sure you can see it with your eyes in your Bible or don't accept it. Don't challenge it with an arrogant spirit. 
Challenge it with humility and tenderness, but make sure you can see it with your eyes or your Bible. But here's my point. These ideas might be vaguely familiar to some of you. Well, I mean, many of you, I know you know them, but others of you, they're vaguely familiar. And you don't really quite know what they mean. They're just kind of like biblical terminology that doesn't mean anything. And I'm going to encourage you that when you leave this conference, get a few friends, get the notes out, look the verses up, take them very personally about yourself. I have become the righteousness of what? How did I become the righteous? Say, well, what does that mean? Because, beloved, it's more than forgiveness. A miracle took place in your spirit that has dramatic implications if you know it took place. If you don't know about this, you can be a born-again Christian and live in a self-imposed poverty for decades of your spiritual life, but it's an unnecessary poverty. I'm talking about poverty in a negative sense. You have inherited vast wealth the day you were born again, but you can live like a beggar under a bridge who got a vast inheritance one day. A distant family member dies, leaves him millions of dollars, but he never ever accesses the millions of dollars he could starve to death as a beggar under the bridge the rest of his life and have a brand new a glorious inheritance but he never uses it many believers that i know they know this verse sort of they go yeah i know that verse i've heard of it i even have it underlined in my bible but they don't access it they don't live conscious of it it's not something they are talking to the holy spirit about on a regular basis they aren't drawing on the benefits of this reality. It's just a doctrinal point that they nod at, and then they move on and they don't access it. They are like the beggar living under the bridge, starving, who received the inheritance of a fa distant family member, but the man doesn't know how to access the millions he just inherited. Now, I am pained. I mean in the sense of love over so many sincere believers that live constantly in brokenness and in poverty and they never access the power or the resource that is theirs instantly the day they're born again in their legal position before God. Paragraph B. What are some of the old things that passed away? Now I give this list that I have here in B and C I give these two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, about five times in the notes here, you're going to notice. Because I want to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, and if you skip session two and three, I want you to run into this list in session four and five. I want you to see this list over and over. We cannot emphasize it enough. That's why I put it all through the notes. Number one, condemnation or judgment. I'm talking about the punitive judgment where God rejects you. I'm not talking about the Lord's redemptive disciplines in our life. That's not what I mean. I mean condemnation where He rejects you. Condemnation is over forever. Romans 8.1 There is now no condemnation for anybody that's born again in the presence of God. None whatsoever. It's not the same as conviction where the Holy Spirit points his finger at an area and says, you need to repent of this. Condemnation means God has rejected you because of the sin and you're out of his presence. There is no condemnation. It is not the same as conviction. Because the Holy Spirit loves us, he continues to convict us of sin. Because conviction of sin is the Holy Spirit shedding light on an area that we live in agreement with darkness and the Holy Spirit says, if you live in agreement with darkness, that darkness will touch your emotions and your mind. It will hurt you. It will make your spirit dull. It will make your spiritual life boring. So the Holy Spirit in love says, break your agreement with this thought pattern. Break your agreement with this character trait. That's called conviction. That liberates us from the power of darkness in our mind and emotions. That's glorious. Number two, before you were born again, you were powerless 
to challenge the promptings of sin, the sinful promptings that rise up in your body and in your mind. When anger would rise up in you, you had no power to challenge it and to dismiss it in a supernatural way. When anger rose up in you, the only thing you could do to keep yourself out of trouble was to grit your teeth and let the anger pass like a storm and whether five minutes or five hours or five days later when the anger lifts oh, okay good that's gone you had no supernatural ability to silence that an ang anger and to cause it to go away I'm gonna talk about that in about ten minutes you could grit your teeth and endure lustful feelings angry feelings anxious feelings and let the storm of those negative feelings pass but you could not cause them to go away right away the most sophisticated people in high society they have no power over their sinful emotions but to let the storm ride and a few minutes or a few hours later huh, they're back to normal again and that was a weird mood they will they might call it it's called being powerless before sin but beloved the day you were born again that powerlessness left that doesn't mean the sin left but it means your inability to challenge it is gone because now you have the ability to challenge it we'll look at that again in a few moments you were under darkness you had no ability to understand the word in a way, the Bible, in a way that it would inspire love in your heart for God. You could have intellectual knowledge of the Bible, but it would never inspire you to obey and love Jesus. You could read it, you could understand facts, you could understand concepts, but it's still darkness because until it inspires you to love and obey, it's just a dead concept. That's called darkness. Even if Somebody in darkness knows truth intellectually like demons. Demons know the truth intellectually, but it doesn't inspire them to obey and love God. That's called darkness. You couldn't read your Bible and find inspiration, spiritual inspiration from it. And fourth, we were destitute. We did not have a lasting purpose. I mean, you may win all the gold medals, you may have more money than Bill Gates, you may have more power than the president, but that purpose will not last if it's not in the will of God in your life. But you may have no fame, no fortune, no big gifts, no following, but if you're faithful to do the will of God, Jesus remembers it and rewards you in the age to come because that faithfulness no matter how small it is it moves him and he remembers it and that makes your life powerful and relevant because it's in obedience you have lasting relevant purpose if you're not born again you can achieve the greatest athletic musical political economic achievements medical breakthroughs and they can make an impact in your lifetime but they have no eternal impact they don't live in God's heart for millions of years with honor on them so no matter what you accomplish it's we're destitute of a lasting purpose while we're an old creation while we're not born again when we're outside the grace of God but inside the grace of God you can have the most difficult lonely afternoon but you're doing the will of God in that afternoon and I tell you beloved God remembers it forever and it makes that afternoon powerful forever Let's look at paragraph C now these are just the opposite of the four things I just said and you can say these four things in different ways you can come up with different terms if you want to this is just how I've said it over the years and I, I like saying it this way but it's not the only way to say these truths all things were new by virtue of you receiving the gift of righteousness beloved your spirit
spirit became righteous. Your spirit became so righteous, the Holy Spirit will live in you forever. If your spirit did not become righteous, the Holy Spirit could not dwell in you for one moment, let alone of forever. God can't dwell in darkness, but he, he did a miracle in your spirit. So, instead of condemnation, it's the opposite. We're fully accepted. But the idea of being accepted is a very strong idea. But some people don't follow it all the way through. I like to add the word, you're enjoyed by God, even in your weakness. When you have the assurance, when you have the assurance that you're enjoyed by God, not tolerated, enjoyed, before you're mature, you're sincere because you've made a sincere and consistent decision to obey the eight Beatitudes we looked at yesterday. You can talk about any practical ex uh, 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 expression of righteousness and they will always go back to one of those eight Beatitudes. When Jesus outlined the eight Beatitudes, he really gave the, the broadest most concise scope of what holiness or what faithfulness to God or what loving God looks like walking consistently in those eight Beatitudes. Now nobody walks in them consistently because of our weakness. We come up short. But I'm not even talking so much about your ability to stay consistent in doing them. I'm talking about your ability to be consistent in reaching for them. Committing to them even if you come up short. But if you come up short, which I do all the time, and I come before the Lord and I, I repent of it, I act in pride, I'll say something in anger, or I'll do something in selfishness, the Holy Spirit will convict me. And, I, and don't argue with the Holy Spirit. He's way smarter than you. He loves you way more than you love you. He's so on your team. Agree with him. Don't find a Bible verse to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit won't buy it. Why do I want to argue with the Spirit and stay entrenched in an area of darkness and have my heart stuck, dull, and bored? Why do I want to do that? Why could, what possible wise reason would there be for doing that? Well, it feels good to sin. For a minute and a half or less, but it takes away our ability to have a vibrant spirit. To walk in the glory of the power of love. Loving God. Feeling the loving, love of God and loving others. Well, when we come up short, the eight Beatitudes, or you pick any expression of righteousness, because they all fit in one of those eight Beatitudes. Jesus, the master teacher of righteousness. He laid it out. You can't improve on those eight Beatitudes. When I come up short at them, and when I, the Holy Spirit makes it known to me, and I agree with Him and I repent of them, I declare war on them, I push delete. Once you repent, push delete and walk in confidence with God that very minute. Don't talk to God for a couple of weeks about how bad you did. Try to negotiate with Him. Beloved, you will never be able to produce an argument that will motivate God more than the righteousness of Jesus and His death on the cross. That is all the motivation God needs to completely receive you fully and freely. Well, when I sin, I admit it, I confess it, I repent of it, which means I declare war on it. And I may stumble in that same pride six hours later that very day and say some proud thing, repent it again. When you confess it, push delete, forget it. I'm talking about in terms of your walk with God, you might need to go confess it to a brother or sister that you talked about or did something, go do that. But I mean in terms of my walk with God, I can stand before Him, acceptance is a good word, but it's not strong enough. We can stand before Him, 
in the full assurance that we are enjoyed by God. Enjoyed. In our weakness. Father, here I am in the righteousness of Christ. I love you. You love me. You enjoy me. Beloved, that confidence makes you run to Him with an open heart instead of from Him, hiding from Him, fearing condemnation. And when you run to Him, an open heart in your weakness, that's the way you'll grow in the eight Beatitudes. You take a sincere believer who does not know these truths, they're filled with condemnation. When they sin, they run from God and they hide from Him. And they try to go do something to make up for it. They put themselves in maybe a week or a month of spiritual probation. And God says, away with that foolishness. Don't put yourself in probation. Stand before me in confidence. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But we're talking the whole context of a sincere believer who's repenting of the sin as the Holy Spirit shows them because they're people studying their Bible. And when you study your Bible, the Holy Spirit speaks to you more clearly about the darkness that we walk in. You know, I've talked to plenty of people who go, well, the Holy Spirit's not convicting me. I go, well, it's not surprising. You never read your Bible and you never talk to the Holy Spirit. You're looking for ways to bolster up confidence in your compromise. Start a daily conversation with the Holy Spirit. Read your Bible and talk to Him. And I promise you, He'll talk to you a lot more about the darkness that's nullifying your vibrant spirit, that's shutting you down. Well, I love... The fact that God enjoys us. It makes Christianity awesome. It is so fun to walk in relationship with the one who is perfect love and he enjoys me. I mean, the truth is, I like God so much because he likes me so much. If God did not like me, I don't know where I would be. But he likes me so much. And beloved, you like anybody who likes you that much. But do you know it? Do you draw on that? Do you, when you sin, realign your soul and say, I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. All things are new. The old things have passed away. The condemnation's gone. I stand here right before you. <clears throat> well, we have the authority. We don't just have acceptance and enjoyment by God. It's more than that. We have the authority to use the name of Jesus. Before you're born again, if a demon attacks you, and beloved demons attack unsaved people all the time. They call them some med medical disorder. I don't mean all medical disorders are demons, that's not what I'm saying. But, but when people are under demon torment, often they find a medical disorder to put it in a category. Or they call it, I've been in a funk for a while. You've been in a funk for three years. I guess it has been three years. Beloved, you're oppressed by a demon. That's what's going on. Are you kidding? That's what that is? I thought it was a funk. I, you know, all my family was this way. Well, you've got five generations of oppressed people in your family. My point is, the person outside of Christ has no power to cause the works of darkness to stop. When they say to a demon, stop, well, they don't do that. But if they did, the demon would say, no. Under what authority do I stop? Because you're causing me pain. The demon goes, that's what we specialize in, causing you pain. We have permission to cause you pain because we are over you. You have no one over you that is more powerful than us. But the day you're born again, beloved, all things are new. You have authority. You can release the works of God and you can stop the works of the devil. And you do it by words. That's the miracle. You don't do it by revving yourself up and, devil! I don't really mean it this time. They, so what? You don't do it by your personality. You do it because you're in Christ Jesus as a new creation. Your legal position before God is you have the right to use the authority of Jesus to release the works of God 
and to stop the works of darkness. It's called authority. Now, authority is different than power. Let me give you an illustration. When the policeman stops a car, he puts his hand up, blows his whistle, stop. It isn't the power of the policeman because he can bench press 300 pounds where he stops the car with his muscles. No. He's not stopping the car with power, his power. He's stopping the car with delegated authority of the United States government. Because if taken to an extreme, behind that policeman's hand is the city government, the state government, and the national government backing up when he says stop. And if taken to an extreme, the entire national government will back up his hand that says stop. That's authority. We don't stop the devil by our human power because we're tired of it this time and we don't want it anymore. We appeal to the only man that has authority. We appeal to his name. We raise up our badge, so to speak. Don't do it symbolically. Don't raise your badge up, blow a whistle. Don't be weird. But you can, you can whisper it. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a matter if you shout it, the devil, you really mean it. And if you whisper it, then you sort of mean it. No, that's not how it works. You have the authority of Jesus the day you're born again. You can mutter it. In the name of Jesus, stop. And if you mean it, the devil has to stop. But the devil won't stop initially more times, most times, because you don't really mean it. You're experimenting with it. And that's okay at the early days, you're figuring out if it's true or false. But beloved, let me tell you, something dynamic happened the day you were born again. Many believers don't draw on this reality. They live like that poor, homeless beggar under the bridge that has a brand new family inheritance, but he doesn't know how to use it, so he puts it in his pocket, and he just lives in poverty for the next decade under the bridge while possessing millions. Again, that's a made-up analogy. I've used it over the years sometimes. Somebody will say, who's that beggar under the bridge? I want to help him out. I go, no, I want to get a commission from him. No, I just made the story up. There's another one. Now, this is the one I really want to focus on in this session, the remaining few moments, but then particularly the next session. The indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That the day that we were born again, because our spirit man became righteous, the Holy Spirit came to live in us. Beloved, our inner man is the Holy of Holies. You carry the Holy of Holies around with you. The Holy Spirit, like a consuming fire, Fire dwells in your spirit right here in you. Though you don't necessarily, you can't measure him, and I'll get to that in a minute, but he's there. In the Old Testament, the glory of God appeared to Moses on the mountain in the bush. Most of you know it in Exodus 3. Moses looks up. He saw the bush was burning. I saw the movie a couple times. Moses went up, Charlton Heston went up before that bush, burning like fire. Wow. That's the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God. I love what John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila call him, the living flame of love. God himself, God the Holy Spirit, the living flame of love. But here's what happened. That fire dwells in your belly right now. That's not the right way to say it. That's King James language. It dwells in your spirit, man. That ball of fire. God of reality. I don't mean poetically. I don't mean figuratively. God himself dwells in your spirit the day you're born again. But most believers never draw on it. They don't talk to him. They don't dialogue with that indwelling presence. And therefore, Though positionally all things are new in their spirit, man, in their soul, their personality, they live in darkness, they live in boredom, they live in depression, they live in confusion, and the Holy Spirit says, I live in you. Talk to me. 
I have a lot of things to tell you, but I won't start the conversation. I'm waiting for you to start it. Now, every now and then, the Holy Spirit does start the conversation. If the Holy Spirit starts the conversation, mostly you're going to get corrected. Sometimes it's not that way. But the Holy Spirit waits, dwelling in our spirit, for us to begin the conversation with Him throughout the day. And as long as we talk to Him, He will stay engaged in the conversation. When we're not interested in it, we have other things to do, He will back off of the conversation and let us do it our own way. A lot of believers don't fellowship with the Spirit. They don't talk to Him. They don't even know He's there. They know it technically. They know it, it's a Bible verse that says it, but it's not a functional reality in their life. Paragraph D. Now I'm repeating from yesterday. We receive the righteousness of God in three time frames. Three tenses. The day you're born again, you your spirit man, your born again spirit, fully, forever completely receive the righteousness of God it can never be improved upon your spirit will not be more righteous a million years from now in the resurrection than it is the day you're born again that's the past tense that's final that's complete one-third of your salvation you fully have it in your experience one-third of your salvation you are f it's fully yours it will never be improved the next third of your salvation is the salvation of our soul. Our mind and emotion are renewed. Our characters changed. The future tense of our salvation is our body. That our body will have the same supernatural properties as the resurrected body of Jesus. And that is amazing. And sometimes that glorious promise to our body being redeemed fully in the age to come it breaks it in this age, we call that healing. When in this age, we get expressions of that ultimate glorification of redemption of our body. Because we can experience tokens of the fullness of our salvation in the age to come. We can experience part of it now. But as far as our spirit man is concerned, we have the fullness of it right now. We'll never have more than we have now, but we have to know it. We have to draw on it. We have to recognize it. And having the Spirit live in our spirit is very, very dynamic in its implications. Paragraph E. Now to understand the glory of the new covenant, and again, this might be new to some of you, so give yourself a break. You don't have to grasp it all in the next 12 minutes. You don't have to grasp it in this conference. You can go home and say, yeah, that sounded pretty cool, I think. It was a little confusing. I didn't get half of it, but sounds like it's really neat, like I'm real rich and I don't know it, but I would have figured it out. Study this stuff. Talk it through with some people. Look up other Bible verses. Begin to say these things to the Holy Spirit who lives in your spirit. Well, here's the verse that lets us know that human beings are created in three parts, spirit, soul, and body. One preacher said it this way. I like it. I've used it for years. Man is a spirit. That's the essence of who you are. You are a spirit. He has a soul. That's your personality. And you live in a body. That's how you express your personality through your body with your five senses. Let's look at this again a little bit more in paragraph F. Our spirit... It's where we communicate with God directly. In our spirit, that's where the Holy Spirit lives. That's where the impressions of the Holy Spirit come from. Our soul speaks about our personality. Soul speaks about our personality. How we express ourselves to others. Our body has five senses and because of our five senses we can receive from the physical world from the five senses with our spirit 
we receive from the heavenly world. With our soul, we interact with other people. With our body, we receive from sight, smell, touch, taste, sound. We receive from the physical world. It's a little simplistic, but it's a good enough place to start. Now here's the problem. Most believers that I know, and I don't want to make a judgment on everybody, I'm trying to be helpful, this isn't critical. I'm trying to alert people so they go, oh, good point. Not like, oh, how dare you say that I'm missing something. That's not my point. I'm trying to be helpful and alert you. Not to be critical. Most believers don't know who they are in their spirit man. They know who they are in their soul. They know what they like. They know what music they like, what music they don't like. They know what food, they have certain temperaments. They know a little bit about who they are in their soul, a little bit. They can talk about what they like and dislike and what they, their giftings, their abilities, their mindsets. They know a little bit of who they are in their body. Do they have musical ability, athletic ability, what their body can do, can't do? They know who they are a little bit in their soul and their body, but they don't know who they are in their spirit. We train our soul at the university. We train our body in the gymnasium. Or in the music institute. We train our body. Beloved, we need to train our spirit too. The way that, and that's the most neglected training of the human makeup even in the church. We need to train our spirit. Now, we train our body, our soul in the university, etc. We train our, our body in the gym, etc., other places too. We train our spirit from the Word because only the Word can tell us what's true about our spirit. Philosophy can't tell us. They're just guessing, and they're guessing wrong. World religions can't tell us. The only reliable training manual for who you are in your spirit is the Word of God. And there's much in the Bible as to who you are in Christ Jesus. But we need to value training our spirit. Let me give you an example of why it's so important. Paragraph G. And by the way, we're not going to finish all these notes, but that's never even the goal. I don't even try to. I like to give you plenty more notes than we'll ever cover so you can study more on your own if you want to. Paragraph G. Before, I'm going to give you some training on your spirit. Before Adam sinned, back in the Garden of Eden, his spirit man governed his soul, his emotions, and his spirit governed his body, his five senses. His connection with God and His Spirit was predominant in His life and personality. That's God's order. That's how it will be forever for the redeemed. However, after He sinned, after Adam sinned, His five senses, His physical appetites, His emotions, they now dominated his spirit. Because when Adam sinned, his spirit didn't become obsolete. It didn't disappear, but it became spiritually dead. He did not have communion with God in his spirit after he sinned. That's one thing Jesus restored when he went and purchased our salvation. He put us in a place to where we received his righteousness, to where God comes to dwell in our spirit. That's the beginning of the restoration of the relationship. Adam's spirit became subordinate. It became a slave to his appetites. If his appetites, whether food or his sexual appetites or whatever, if they had intense desire, his spirit man just didn't weigh in, had nothing to say, and his appetites ruled his life. Or... Not his body, let's talk about his soul. His emotions dominated him. When his emotions got real excited in a good way or real excited in a bad way, he made wild decisions based on excited emotions. And God would say, no, I want you to receive direction from me in your spirit. 
I want your soul and your body serving your spirit, not the other way around. I'm just giving you real Christianity 101 training on your spirit. Paragraph H. At the new birth. Oh, look at this. My goodness. He that's joined to the Lord. The born-again man, the born-again woman, the born-again child. This is breathtaking. You are one spirit with the Godhead. What? Is that in the Bible? You're born again, you're one spirit with God. That, that doesn't make you God. That's not what it's saying. It's saying God the Holy Spirit made your spirit like a little holy of holies that wherever you go, the spirit goes with you. The spirit says, I will talk to you. If you start the conversation, I will keep it going. When you finished with it, I'll stop. More times than not. Not always, but more times than not. That holy of holies, that burning bush of Moses is inside of us. He's a person, by the way. He's not an influence. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an influence. You know, I've been in some Holy Spirit meetings where people fling the Holy Spirit around like he's a plaything. You don't fling the Holy Spirit around. You don't jump in the river of the Holy Spirit and swim and do backstrokes. Sometimes I see our people do that and I go, do they know who he is? You ever read Genesis 1? He broods over the face of the earth in power. You don't do backstrokes in the Holy Spirit. You don't do sword fights with him. You don't scoop him onto people. We, we do all that stuff at IHOP, but I tell him, stop it. Time to grow up. He's a person. He's awesome. He's powerful. He dwells in us. He inspires us. He teaches us. He's not a toy. He's not poetry. He's not an imagery of something. He's real, and he's in you, and he's God. Top of page 29. At the new birth, the day you're born again, you didn't even know this. You say, yes, Jesus, I want you. And the Spirit of God comes. You don't even know it. The day I was born again, I didn't know the Spirit came to live in me. I didn't know I became a new creation. I didn't know the righteousness of God. I was the righteousness of God, my spirit. Man, I didn't know any of that. I just know I felt good. And I liked God. And I thought, this is so cool. I was 16, 15 years old. I prayed the prayer and I went, amazing. I think it's real. I, I love God. Wow! That's all I knew. And that's a good beginning for day one. I mean, that held me over for a while. But then the time came, I wanted to get educated in the Bible on my spirit man. Because until you get educated on what happened to your spirit, you can't grow in it. We don't ask God for the things He's already given us. We thank Him for them and ask the Holy Spirit to enable us to experience a greater measure of it. Now at the new birth, our spirit man was so radically changed, so radically refashioned, the Bible four times, New Testament, uses the word created. Your spirit man, I don't know if this is the perfect terminology, but it was recreated. A new creation. Your spirit man was not improved. It is a radical new creation that is instant and final and permanent and totally free. You're fully accepted by God in that new state. You have the indwelling spirit. You have the authority of Jesus and you can have the most quiet afternoon all by yourself doing the will of God and that afternoon is important forever to God he will remember it forever your life is relevant forever nobody else appreciates you God is moved by your obedience he remembers it and rewards you on the final day paragraph J 
Now here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. We don't feel our spirit with our five senses. Because our spirit is that. It's spirit. And our five senses cannot measure spirit. You can't get a handful of spirit to measure with your five senses. Emotionally, you can't feel your spirit. You can feel the impact of the Holy Spirit in you on your emotions, but you can't like lock in and just feel spirit. It doesn't work that way. Again, you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, the result of that on your emotions. So because we can't measure our spirit, I want to get a measurement of how much of God is in me. You can't do it with empirical methods of your five senses. So therefore, because we can't measure it, we can't get a bottle of it, we can't recognize, discern it in that sense, we tend to ignore our spirit, and that's disaster. You will never walk out the eight Beatitudes, the details of that, without an active relationship with the Holy Spirit, talking to Him, based on the confidence that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you don't have that confidence, that when you fail, God accepts you because of Jesus and enjoys you, if you don't know you're talking to the Spirit as you're walking out the eight Beatitudes, if you don't know you have the authority over the devil to stop his oppression of you, beloved, you can't walk out the eight Beatitudes without the New Testament truths of who we are in Christ. Jesus did not outline the new creation truths. He gave us the lifestyle of love in the eight Beatitudes, and he all but said, don't worry, I'll raise up a man named Paul in a few years. He will give you the details of the new creation of how you can now walk out the eight Beatitudes. This verse in Colossians, it's amazing. Verse 3, Colossians 3, verse 3, your life is hidden. Your spirit, man, now catch this, it's even hidden from you. You don't even know the truth about the full truth. The things I'm saying, I barely understand. I mean, I could say them, and I understand them 101, initial, but when I stand before the Lord, I will be blown away by how much of this is so much bigger than I think it is. This dynamic in our spirit is hidden even from us. Even the glory of our life, when we obey Jesus in little ways, we forget about it. He remembers it forever. Even the glory of that small obedience is hidden from us. We lose the impact of it and think our life means nothing. And Jesus says, what are you talking about? You've been obeying me for years. I have a long record of it. You've moved me. You will be surprised how powerful your life is when it's revealed to you one day in the resurrection. Beloved, there's many of you, your life is far more powerful than you know. It's hidden even from you. Not just from others, it's hidden from you. So we live by faith. We live by faith in what the Word says, and we live in dialogue with the Holy Spirit. That's what prayer and fasting is about. Prayer and fasting is about dialoguing with the Holy Spirit. Because the things that are freely given to us by the death of Jesus, we cannot walk in them without an active relationship with the Holy Spirit day by day. So a lot of people talk about, Jesus died for me, it's all mine. That's right legal position. But what they don't know, if they don't have an aggressive, active relationship with the Holy Spirit, they won't walk in the power of them today. It takes the Holy Spirit in your life, in your dialogue with Him, to enjoy the free wealth Jesus purchased for you. The two of them go together to the glory of the Father. I'm going to end with that.